This is a WGNS Action Line, talking with Rutherford County newsmakers about what matters most to you. Now, your host, Scott Walker. In studio joining us this morning, we have James Evans, the Chief Communications Officer for the Rutherford County Schools. So, James, what are we going to talk about this morning? Well, good morning. Thanks for having us here. I also have Janet Flannery here with me this morning. She is our coordinator for new teacher programs and for teacher recruitment. We're going to be talking about some of that this morning. This is uh, really the season. The season's been going on for a few months, but the hiring season for the new school year. Ms. Flannery does a lot of work with that, going to different teacher recruitment fairs and things like that and has been in this role for a little over a year now right and uh, she has done a phenomenal job of keeping our classrooms with staffed quality teachers and then we'll also can talk about uh, the new getting ready for the new school year we've got parents already calling saying okay it's July officially it's July 2nd so you know how do I get my kid enrolled registration all those kinds of things so we've got some new opportunities to help that make it easier this year. Janet, starting with you, what are some of the positions available that we uh, need to fill before the school year starts? Well, we have plenty of positions in both uh, certified and classified. Um, That means that you're either a licensed teacher or an aspiring teacher or some of our support uh, personnel positions. Um, We have educational assistants, cafeteria, uh, custodial positions, as well as uh, teaching positions in anything from special education to ESL to core curriculum classrooms, um, our CTE classrooms as well. So if you have an interest in any of that, we can find a position for you. So how hard is it to fill these positions these days? Because I know unemployment is so low, it's got to make it more difficult. It is, it is. Um, But luckily we have a lot of great uh, committed teachers that are already in the classroom. And I know there's plenty of people in our community that are interested in joining our teachers in the classroom. So we have ways that we can help you get your license. Right now we have a program in-house with Rutherford County called Teach Now. That is our district-led ed prep program that's been approved by the state of Tennessee. And we're able to take aspiring educators, someone who has an interest in education, and run them through a program that teaches them all of the pedagogy, educational theory, things that you would get from a traditional program. And at the end of it, you come out with your license. When somebody applies to be a part of the county schools, can they say, you know, I live in this area, so I would prefer working in this area if if that is possible? Sure, I work with all kinds of people that call and they'll say that they live on this side of the district or that side of the district or even outside of the district. Um, And if you want to call me and kind of talk through that, I'm happy to find a place that works for you, that it's a school close to your home or where your, your kids attend. Whatever works for you, I can find a position for you inside the county. And James, when you have a teacher who's working in the county, but yet they may live in, let's say, Wilson County, is there a possibility their children can go to school here as well? Sure. So our board allows teachers as one of the, all of our employees, actually, but it's one of their benefits that they can bring their children to where they work. So if I were to teach, say, uh, at Laverne High School, and I want my child to go there with me because I, I, I live in Murfreesboro, uh, you can get what's known as a zone exemption for your child to go to school with you. If you need a, another grade level that's not offered at your school, so if you're a high school teacher but you have a middle school child, you can get an exemption to go to the feeder school for where you work. So it's all based on the you know the, the uh, geographic where you work you can bring your child with you as we begin that process of starting a new school year which is right around the corner is there going to be a new school that opens we do have a new school this year to it's a repurposed school uh, so the former laverne primary school which also then got renamed to be roy waldron annex it's on the same campus as roy waldron but they're separate buildings It's being reopened this year as a school called Simon Springs Community School. It's a school that's for grades one through eight, and it will serve special education students who have some severe behavior issues and need some different types of interventions. It's not an alternative school, but it's a behavior school to help these students get the supports they need to get them back to their traditional school. And then what other new schools or future schools are we looking at? We have a new school that will open a year from now, next August, Poplar Hill Elementary School. It's on the Beatty Farm property. A lot of people call it the Beatty Farm School, but it actually has a name now, Poplar Hill Elementary. That opens next year, as well as the um, additions at Smyrna High School, Oakland High School, and Riverdale. Those are scheduled to open next August, too. Smyrna High School is actually ahead of schedule, and so we, we may be able to open it somewhat this year. 
but we'll know that later on. We're still waiting on a few details to be finalized. But those three additions will open. And then the next school after that would be a middle school at the Beatty Farm property, which would then be called Poplar Hill Middle School. We haven't received the bond funding for that yet, but we're in the process of getting that. But it's it's the next one in the pipeline. And then we're also looking at an addition to Laverne High School a couple of years from now as well. Those are all the immediate new schools coming online. Has construction officially began for the elementary school on the Beatty property? Yes, yes, it's underway. And then that opening date should be, what, the 2025-26 school year? It is scheduled for August of 2025. And as a, I got an update on it last week, we're on, on track with that. So everything's on schedule. Things happen sometimes, but to my knowledge, we've never been late opening a brand new full school. Now, additions sometimes get delayed, but the, a brand new school they've always opened in July or August. And Janet, are you already looking at the possibility of filling that school with teachers? Is that something that's in the planning stages now? Yes, actually, we just did a, an advertising boost on social media to try to gain interest in our Simon Springs um, openings that we have. So we are currently looking for special education teachers. Um, I believe as far as a district, we have about 20 special education openings. So if that's something that you're passionate about, serving our students that way, it's definitely a need for our district, and I'd love to talk to you, so please please reach out. And so Simon Springs makes us, we'll have 51 schools now starting this school year, and then when Poplar Hill opens, that'll be 52. We also have one other school in the pipeline. We have purchased the Allstate building that's across from the post office on Church Street. It's a three-story kind of stone-looking building. Uh, we will be opening it as an alternative school. Uh, it is called Westbrook Woods academy we don't have an exact date yet it was going to open we're, we're working with the city on some of the planning issues that go involved in that the codes and things like that but it will open up as a new alternative school for high school students if not this year it will be next august so with that future school the alternative school there on church street is the building that's there right now going to be torn down a new building built what are you going to do there not tearing down we're renovating the existing building we had one uh allstate was the last resident that was in the building i'm not, I'm not using the right word there but tenant that's what i'm trying to say tenant and i think that they've moved out now we we purchased it but then had to let them finish out their leases and so on and so we're going from there and how many alternative schools will you have once that is open that'll be our third so we right now we have daniel mckee alternative school which serves the murfreesboro and blackman areas eagleville things like that and then I'm, not, I'm sorry not blackman eagleville rockville and murfreesboro and then smyrna west serves blackman smyrna and laverne i know years ago within the county schools whenever students got into certain types of trouble i guess maybe an in-school suspension of some kind they would get sent on occasion to let's say daniel mckee right. is that still what happens today or, or what does occur so you have a couple of different um ways that you would go to Daniel McKee or Smyrna West and Janet dealt with a lot of these as an assistant principal yeah. I'm sure but it's either you're having persistent ongoing behavior issues you know multiple smaller things that are adding up because you're just having defiance issues or whatever or there's something larger like a zero tolerance offense like you had drugs at school or or something like that and you would go for those reasons and then but the goal of those schools is to help get the students rehabilitated and get them back into a traditional school that's they're not supposed to be there for a long-term time so a lot of times it may be 45 to 60 days that they're there they go through the program and then they're back that's the intent but we've only had the two alternative schools i started with the district 20 years ago in 2004 and we had two alternative schools and look how much we've grown in 20 years we had about 29,000 students when i started we have 52,000 now so not quite doubled but getting closer and we need another building just because there's there, there's there's a need for another alternative school just because of the number of students that we have. Have you seen good results by sending these kids to these alternative schools as opposed to, let's say, sending them home or just having them sit in the gymnasium cafeteria? But are you having better results with sending them to these schools? Well, I mean, there are different options on the menu when you're telling talking about behavior issues sending them to the alternative school is not usually the first option you want to use there's different things the school can do out of school suspension in school suspension different behavior interventions we do have some that are repeat offenders and go back to the alternative school more than once but for a lot of students one time's all it takes and then they go through the program and they don't want to be back and so they 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 fix whatever it is they need to fix and and again what grades would be sent 
to these alternative schools? Right now it serves grades 6 through 12, so it's middle school and high school, and that would be the same for the new school as well. I'm guessing you don't have the more extreme troubled problems in elementary age students as you do in middle and high school? It's different, and the Simon Springs Community School, that's one of the purposes that it's helping to serve is that you do have some behavior issues with elementary students sometimes, but it's it's different because they're so much younger. It's usually there's a root cause behind the behavior and some, some different supports can help them be rehabilitated, but it's a different approach. It's not meant to be punitive. It's meant to be restorative. That's what the Simon Springs School will do as well. And Janet, in your years of education, what types of things as far as what students have done in order to get sent to an alternative school, what types of things have you seen? Yeah, so the thing of it is, is that they're not bad kids, they make bad decisions. So um, it's those bad decisions that kind of earn their way to all alternative schools. So a lot of times it, it could be drugs, bring uh, legal substance onto campus. Um, it can be some extreme behaviors like James had mentioned, it could be repetitive behaviors. Um, so when the, we have done all the interventions we can inside the building, and we still can't get them to you know, make good decisions, then maybe that, that they need an alternative placement. Um, what I will say is uh, Jenny Smith at Smyrna West and Dr. Brown, who just retired from us at, at Danny McKee, they are fantastic. I mean, them and their, their staff that they have, they all really believe in that, those restorative practices and teaching the kids how to make better decisions, to think through the decisions that they're making so well that some of the students actually prefer um, to be at those alternative schools and I've had them return to the high school you know saying please let me go back it's a smaller class size there's more attention there's less unstructured time so a lot of them need that structure and sometimes being in a large comprehensive high school there's a lot of unsupervised unstructured time and there's often time for them to maybe make bad decisions so a lot of our students sometimes even prefer to go there because they they need the structure that's something that they crave and the teachers there are do such a great job at really kind of talking through their decision making like getting them to start think about their decision and the consequence that comes with that decision that when they come back to us they either have kind of resolved to the fact that I can do this I can be successful in the high school or they want to go back because they enjoy the structure that that kind of um, school setting provides. I'm guessing that more students than not they may not come out and say hey I need structure but that is truly what they need a lot of the times. Yeah, and those are conversations that they have with them. Even as a former uh, assistant principal, those were conversations that I had even before we sent students there was, you know, this is what happened and the students typically own what happened and this is the consequence that comes with it. And the nice thing is that when they return to us, it's it's we start from from fresh start. Nobody comes back and we're like, oh, we remember that that you had done that. So now we're going to keep that. Um, in our minds, every anyone that returns actually comes back fresh start. We expect you know great things for them. So for newly hired teachers, is that aspect of children getting in trouble, the students, high schoolers, whatever age, is that the hardest thing for a new teacher to deal with? Sure. I mean, classroom management is it's tough um, because you're managing not just one personality but thirty. <laughs> that's a lot. So, yeah, that can be a lot. Um, but I think that's where. W- taking the time to really build relationships with the students will make a huge difference. And that's something that we talk about. It's something that we teach when they go through our Teach Now program, but also if they go through a traditional program, that's something that the universities talk to our our novice teachers about as well. It's all about relationships. If you take the time to build those relationships with the students, then you can minimize the majority of classroom management issues that you have because the students trust you they know that you're there for their best interests you can kind of trust and and discern whether that's like you know a behavior that I really need to address or are they just trying to to kind of be funny sometimes it's best to not even give it the attention that they're trying to get right but you you kind of learn that and and time you know it takes time so a brand new novice teacher it, that might be something they struggle with at the at the beginning but we have instructional coaches inside the building we have administrators inside the building they're there to support new teachers our instructional coaches go into classrooms often and offer advice 
ways that they can maybe handle certain behaviors inside the classroom, but also ways that they can engage the students. If we keep the students engaged in the learning, we also see that we can minimize some of those classroom behaviors as well. And this is one of the things that is the envy of some other school districts. We have new teachers that say, man, we like it here in Rutherford County because of all the support they give us Mm -hmm. to get acclimated to being in the classroom. Mr. Gill, when he was director of schools, used to tell this story that um, he was taken to the classroom, he was handed the textbook, the teacher's edition, and said, we'll see you at Christmas. And that was it. And there was no support back then. And a lot of school districts, traditionally, that's the way it was. What Janet didn't mention, and she's running it, is there's a something new that she launched last year that's called Ignite. And it's for teachers with, it's either brand new or three Within years or their less, first right? Or second year, yeah. uh, and it's all about just helping them with those supports, the mentorships, the classroom management. I have family members who said that first year of teaching, not because of the content they're teaching, but because of just dealing with 30 kids. I have three boys of my own and they all have different personalities. And there are days that I want to go running for the hills. I can't imagine having 30 different personalities and doing that. And every year you get a new set and you become a little family, but it takes a while for new teachers to learn how to do that. And so we have all these great resources to help them become successful with that kind of relationship building. Is there a big difference in the demographic of new teachers fresh out of college versus a, a Teach Now teacher? Most of our teachers that come through Teach Now, they are this is their second career or they're coming out of industry. Um, they've either been a parent and and now, now all of a sudden they're empty, empty nester and they've decided you know that they're going to pursue what they have or always felt inside that maybe they'd make a great teacher. So those are kind of the aspiring teachers that we serve through the Teach Now program where traditionally going through MTSU or, or a surrounding university, they're more of the, that novice teacher that, you know, they just graduated, so they're in their, their late 20s. And um, we're more, we see more adults where this is their second career or coming into a, a new industry out of something else that they did. Maybe they were in, working in insurance last, last year and now they've decided to kind of pursue uh, teaching. So we're seeing more adults come through our program i would imagine it would be intimidating for a brand new teacher maybe one that has never had kids of their own it would be intimidating to all of a sudden be leading a classroom of 30 students and then switch classes the next hour 30 new students yeah well we were looking for people who are passionate about that so they they need to have some type of desire to work with students and i think when you have that passion or that servant's heart or you look at this as a ministry for yourself that makes a world of difference and change your perspective on putting in the work to become a teacher. We're looking for people that are passionate about helping in their community and helping educate and change students. We want them to invest in in our community. I'm sure this happens as well, and that is when you have a brand new student you just hired, or brand new student, brand new teacher that you just hired, and after their first year into it, they come back and say, you know, I can't do this. I, I just, I don't know what I'm doing. It's hard for me to control a classroom. I can't handle this. Well, that's why we're putting so many things in place for their first year, so that we're hopefully combating that. Um, So like James mentioned, we do have Ignite. That's the way we kind of kick off the year. It's a full day. They they go through six different sessions that talks about classroom culture, classroom management, um, a growth mindset, um, you know, how to work with students with different needs as far as uh, having maybe an IEP or an, or an ESL student inside their classroom and how to still find success with those students, even though that's something that maybe doesn't come naturally uh, to an, a new novice teacher. Um, that's one way we do that. Again, I mentioned in our instructional coaches, they're inside the building. Their sole job is to, is to work with new teachers and to improve instruction practices they come in they co-teach with teachers they'll evaluate um, what's going on in the classroom and then offer suggestions and feedback so they're really closely working with our, those new teachers to try to help them implement you know strategies in the classroom to kind of again give them the support they need give them the confidence help build their confidence but also our administrators do a great job of also coming in there when they do have those classroom behaviors or maybe some issues with classroom management it's really important that those administrators are stepping up and coming in and, and handling that so that the teacher can teach when I was in school I don't think the letters IEP really meant anything back then but what does that mean today so some of our students have cognitive disabilities or cognitive delays so they need additional support so um, there is a a process that they have to go through to qualify for that so we have special education 
um, case managers and teachers that kind of collect data on students and then if they qualify they'll receive an individual education plan so an IEP which basically says they've been identified with some type of cognitive delay or disability and then they build a plan of how we can support that student inside the classroom so maybe they need some extended time maybe they have a slower processing so they need a bit of extended time or maybe um, an ILP which is for our ESL students maybe they need um, you know notes where they're just filling in some blanks rather than having to take all of the material you know which can be overwhelming for a student that doesn't have the same vocabulary or is our vocabulary our English vocabulary is new to them so we might um, they might build in something to their plan that says okay we're, the teacher is going to provide notes the nice thing about that though as far as for a teacher is that classrooms that have those types of students usually comes with an educational assistant so it's almost like a co-teacher that's in your classroom as well so it kind of helps with the burden on, on a teacher to kind of provide all those supports and provide someone that can also assist those students while maybe the teacher is helping other students in the classroom. It would be really tough on a student to uh, not only move to a brand new country but all of a sudden be in a classroom where you don't speak the same language. How hard is that on these students and what success stories have you seen? It's really hard. I mean, it can be very difficult. I, I, I love having attending professional development where our ESL coaches and our ESL specialists talk about I mean, it's just fascinating the way they talk about how they come and and typically when someone comes new to the country, they have 500 their vocabulary is limited to about 500 words that they understand and typically everybody's going to be so proud of me by the way about talking about this because <laughs> <laughs> I paid attention um, it's because a lot of that is also conversational right so we when we're at school we have very academic conversations um, when the students come from another country and they know about 500 words those are conversational words right that they're talking with their friends or their family so that's that creates a whole nother kind of um, you know obstacle for us to kind of as teachers to overcome is that we're we're talking academic language we're talking biology chemistry you know mathematics yeah. that's not a vocabulary term that comes natural to them maybe not even in their own language but also not in our language what we're also finding is a lot of times um, some of the students that are coming over uh, you know where English is not their native language their home country where they're the wherever they're coming from, they haven't learned to read or write even in their own native language. So that's it, another obstacle in its own. Luckily, we have really dedicated ESL teachers inside the classroom. Some of them teach sheltered classrooms for our, um, their tiers based on levels of, you know, their understanding and as far as how, how much vocabulary they know. Um, the ones that have a very very limited amount of vocabulary for them to be successful in a normal classroom they kind of go into this this classroom with like-minded and and same ability students um, and so that way we can really give them the intensive supports that they need um, as they kind of grow in their tiers they can be put back in like a general education um, setting and they'll be able to kind of perform successfully with with the other peers that are in their classroom but there's all kinds of supports inside the building for ESL and uh, special education so it, it's it's definitely something that takes a lot of work from everybody district on down to the classroom so um, but we try to provide all the supports that they need yeah and I was working on a project in May of something I was working on for ESL and had to interview about 25 different ESL students at all grade levels, elementary, middle, high school, going out to schools and interviewing them to talk about their teachers and what was most effective for them and the way they learned. There were students who were in tears saying how much Mr. So-and-so or Miss mm -hmm. So-and-so had helped them. And it's amazing how quickly these kids learn the language. Some of them said, oh, yeah, I've been here 18 months and they spoke English better than I did. So it was, you know, they, they, they had come so far they're still sponges even in in high school um, especially when they're emerged or immersed in it like like they have to be here um, and so our ESL program is top-notch I'm sure some countries where these children are coming from there's not a lot of laws revolving around education so you really have no clue what level they may be in education and if they've even been in school the last year correct yeah and, and for, I, I will give you an example, I think that's something that you asked for earlier, but um, I, 
when I was a teacher at Stewart's Creek Elementary, one of my roles was also to do some intervention with students um, who were falling behind and, and you know, they were just getting zeros or, or missing a lot of work. And I would work with some of them. And I did have a young lady that I worked with who she came with English not being her first language. And it was a struggle for her to complete assignments. And her and I worked together really closely. She then disappeared. I didn't know what happened to her. She actually returned back to her country. And then a, this, the next uh, school year, she actually came back. Well, I had not seen her. And all of a sudden she came into my classroom she's shoving papers in my hand and and I'm like oh I'm so glad to see you and what is this and she's like y you're you're the you're my person and I'm, and I was like okay I, she handed me all these assignments that she had been working on I think that the moral I'm trying to get to is that her and I had built this relationship and that's really going back to all that it's about is is building that relationship gaining that person's trust you know she, she had moved all around I mean it, she was kind of transient. She wasn't always staying in the same place. But the one consistent was that she knew I was going to be there for her. And so she brought all her work, even though they, none of the work was actually for me. Um, but she brought all her assignments to me. And, and from working with her, she was actually able to find some success and, and did end up graduating. But um, I think the thing of it is, is that she knew that someone in the building was looking out for her. Someone in the building was, was there to support her. And I think that's what our ESL teachers do is they provide that support. They provide that constant. So no matter where they're maybe having an obstacle in the building, they know someone is there that, that is supporting them. You may not have that type of relationship building in another country. I, I mean, I don't even know what the education system may look like for some of these kids. Well, so, for some, it ends, it ends very early. I mean, we get... We get some that come in, they don't have beyond it, like a third grade education. So, yeah. wow. And it James, how many languages are spoken within the county schools? Uh, this always surprises people, but we serve around 100 languages. Now, the primary three are English, Spanish, and Arabic. Those are the big three. But then there are lots of others in sub dialects and all of those things that we also serve. Now, I've heard different people from Read to Succeed on the Air with us before talking about how they need ESL tutors, and they always say, well, the person who's teaching ESL does not have to speak the language that some of the students are speaking. How in the world does that work? I think to a certain extent that's actually preferred, because um, we are trying to teach them you know, English. We are trying to get them to kind of acclimate to what their peers are experiencing so they can understand what the teachers are saying. Um, I think it breaks down to actually understanding linguistics, right, and how, how people learn the language. Um, that's something that I think is a strength for ESL teachers is that they know how ling linguistics are, are processed, how we learn it, how you know, the way we need to shape our mouth and, and, and all of that to kind of form sounds and put it all together. And um, it's just amazing when you actually talk to ESL teachers, there's such a science to it and you wouldn't really think there is, but mm. um, there really is a lot of background information that, they, that you kind of need to know as an ESL teacher just to be able to help some of those students kind of, you know, start picking up the English language and, and actually make connections when they understand that, that um, you know, this particular term is something in their language, but now we're trying to teach them that it means something completely different in ours. I remember having a student um, early on that uh, came from Baghdad and red is red. There's no, there's no variation between red and pink, you know? And so when you would kind of talk in the classroom and make that distinction or, or call something, something else, they had no context what to put there because in their language everything was very 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 simple there was no pink there was no rose color everything was red it's red 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 or blue you know or green but there was no variation in, in shades or anything like that so and also with you know shapes we have, we found that in going over the geometry lesson former math teacher by the way um, when we were going over the geometry lesson you know everything that had four sides was square so there was no understanding of rhombus versus rectangle over, you know, everything was a square. Um, so it's, it's just, it's kind of interesting and you just have to roll with it, spend a little bit of extra time with them. But luckily I had an, um, an educational assistant that was also working with me inside the classroom and um, she was able to work more closely with him while I also worked with some of the other students and they just, they get the time and attention and support 
and they do like james said they're sponges and they pick it up it, it sounds like one challenge after another yeah well one be- one of the success, success stories that I remember that I covered a few years ago was an elementary student named Molo who came over and she would, I mean, she told me she didn't speak a lick of English when she came here. Um, to her, it was a bunch of noise being made. She had, she was very lonely at first, but then she started quickly because of her ESL teachers picking up the language. And then she started teaching her fellow students because she spoke their language. She was basically the translator for them and was helping them learn it. And the reason I was covering her for a story was she was going into fifth grade and had been elected the student body president. And, wow. I mean, and when you met her, she, she spoke English just like any of our kids would speak. She had learned so much from first grade to them to, to that point. You would have never known that she was from another, another country. So um, they do acclimate very quickly, and there's a lot of success stories there. And if you haven't heard it, when Janet talks, she's just a, one of the examples, but there's a lot of passion there. She mentioned that you want to be a servant leader, you're passionate about working with kids. Um, that's what makes teaching so, such a rewarding job. That's what we hear time and time again. Maybe you're more inclined to be with kindergarten teacher or kindergarten students, which is a those teachers are a different breed on their own, just because they're dealing with five year olds, you know, twenty five year olds. <laughs> but then you, right, and then but then you also have some that just love working with teenagers. So it really, there is kind of a spot for everyone there. Uh, and that's what makes being in this profession so great. And I'm not a teacher. I just get to work along some really great educators and see them come alive when they talk about it. So I think the common thread is their kids. Yeah. You know, their kids and, and they can do it. They can feel successful if you help them feel successful. And so I think that's the, the common thread is just to remember that they're all students and you're not alone. So even as a teacher, it may feel very overwhelming. I think you mentioned that's a lot. It is, but you're not alone. There's lots of support inside the building, inside the district. Even we have district specialists that will come you know, from the central office and visit teachers and, and kind of help them as well. So there's so much support inside the district that yes, if you think about it, it could become overwhelming, but the truth of it is, is that when you're in it and you see all the supports that we have in place, you're not you're not on an island you're you have lots of people there that are are rooting for you and and standing next to you and and just holding your hand through the whole thing honestly but again it's their kids but i know we're getting close to being out of time before we get out of that i do want to talk about registration a little bit because we're in that season where people are going to get their kids either verified or, or registered for the new school year and we have something new this year that i want to make sure parents know about so Uh, We moved to online registration two or three years ago where we do mostly all online registration. You upload your forms, all those kinds of things. As a parent with multiple kids, I've really appreciated that because I'm not filling out the same form three times. The big, thick packets, I got really sick of that. I complained (laughs) about it a lot. As someone who's in the district like this, there's got to be an easier way. So there's an online verification program where you're just kind of clicking through and verifying that your emergency contacts are still the same. You still live in the same place. You upload your proof of residence, all of those things. That's starting now, so that's online right now. If you're a parent with a new student who's never been in the system before, you have to start fresh, and you can do that now too. But starting next week, um, at four different locations, we're doing pop-up registration centers, and the ones at Blackman High School, ones at Laverne High School, ones at Siegel Middle School, and then the other is at the ESL Center, which is next door to these to Smyrna Primary in Smyrna. At those locations, parents can bring in their documents, sit down with someone, and they will help them register. There will also be translators there, um, so we have English, of course, Spanish, and Arabic. So that's those who speak other languages, families who don't speak English or don't speak it well, they have trouble somewhat with the online registration because they don't understand all the questions, but they will walk them through it. But that's being held from July 8th through the 19th. So it starts next Monday from 8 to 3 at each of those locations. They're just they'll, they're temporary enrollment locations to help people get ready for the school year. We're going to take a short break, and then when we come back, we'll wrap it up and we'll tell folks more about registration and then also applying to be a part of the schools if somebody wants to be a teacher. Right now, that time eight fifty five. You're listening to WGNS. Stay with us, and again, we'll be right back. 
The Action Line on FM 101.9 and AM 1450 Murfreesboro, FM 100.5 Smyrna. Listen and watch at WGNSRadio.com. Broadcasting from the Middle Tennessee Electric Studios. Take control of your account management and energy consumption with the My MTE app. Download from the App Store and manage your account, improve your energy habits and more. MTE, serving to make life better since 1936. Hi, this is Peter Demas with Demas's Restaurants. One of the new menu items that we have added is our Salmon Imperial. Our Salmon Imperial is a fresh cut piece of salmon with shrimp and a crab meat blend. And then we've put our Alfredo sauce on top of it. It's great for a low carb diet that you can get with spinach, but also it just has an amazing flavor with a mixture of all those flavors between the shrimp Alfredo and then our salmon. Please have your family join our family for lunch or dinner seven days a week at Demas's. If you're planning an upcoming trip and want to include your pet, we have all the travel supplies you'll need at Animal City. This is Amanda at Animal City, inviting your family to come do business with my family. Animal City is Murfreesboro's hometown, family-owned pet store. We've had the honor and pleasure of serving the community for 33 years. If you want to see some photos of our adorable pets, feel free to check out our Facebook page, Animal City of Murfreesboro, Tennessee. We're at 919 Northwest Broad Street, right here in Murfreesboro. Capstar is now a division of Old National Bank. You'll notice some changes as we complete the transition to Old National Bank. The Murphy Spread team that you know and trust at Capstar are always ready to serve you. We'll temporarily use Capstar Bank, a division of Old National Bank, until the transition's complete. As always, we're ready to serve you at Capstar Bank, a division of Old National Bank, member FDIC. Get it later from the paper or get it now from the radio. WGNSRadio.com. We're News Radio WGNS 100.5, 101.9, 1450. Online and on your phone at WGNSRadio.com. Again, with us this morning from the Rutherford County Schools, we have James Evans, the Chief Communications Officer, and also with the new Teacher Programs and Recruitment Office, we have Janet Flannery. So I guess as we close, uh, James and also Janet, where do folks apply to be a teacher? And then James, where do people register their students to be at school? So we're looking for degreed people who are interested in becoming a teacher. Uh, If they want to know more, they can go to our website, rcschools. Dot net under the human resources tab they can find available jobs um, where you'll see all our postings um, and then they can fill out the application there as well and also they'll see a tab for teach now which is our uh, district-led EPP where they can go through the ed prep program with us as well or they can reach out to me Flannery J at rcschools.net and I'll be happy to help them find a job James and then registration is underway now uh, either for returning students and parents need to verify their information or for new students they can do it online or they can also go to one of our four pop-up welcome enrollment centers that start next Monday the 8th through the 19th that's at Blackman High School, Laverne High School, Siegel Middle School, and the ESL Center next to Sperna Primary. Sounds good. Again, we've been talking about the Rutherford County Schools this morning, and we'll post this podcast on our website in just a little while. Local news and CBS News come your way next. Friday Night Live. There's always room to shake a leg in front of the stage on the downtown Murphy's Pro Square. Coming up on Friday, July the 5th, 6.30 till 9.30. The O'Donnell playing your favorite country tunes. Coming up August 2nd, the Nashville Alternators. Hit the stage with your favorite 80 to 90s tunes. Come on out, cut a rug, bring a chair, and enjoy the music. Friday Night Live, your summer soundtrack. Brought to you by Wilson Bank & Trust and organized by Main Street Murfreesboro. 